Are you ready for the word? Yes. Turn to Leviticus 23 and we're going to talk about Yom Kippur. Leviticus 23. My goal today is going to be pretty much what it was last Sabbath. And that is I want to take the scriptures and in a very short and concise way go over how simple it is for us to keep Yahweh's feast of Yom Kippur. But at the same time, I want to make us aware of how solemn and serious uh, this Moedim is. To me, um, these last three Moedim are meant to alarm us. Not scare us, but alarm us. Uh, an alarm is a good thing. I sit one every morning. Usually around 3.30, not always, but most of the time around 3.30 in the morning. It doesn't scare me when it goes off because I'm expecting it to go off. I'm wanting it to go off. Uh, most mornings I'm awake before it ever goes off because I've been setting it so many times, so many days through the months and through the years uh, that I have become accustomed to waking up at that time. This alarm is meant to... Make sure I know that the time for slumber is over. Uh, to make sure that I know that there are things to do and a schedule to keep. Make sure I'm up, moving, preparing for everything the day is going to bring. Well, that's the way I see these last three Moedim. I think of them as alarms. <clears throat> Not meant to scare us. Meant to make sure we realize the time for slumber is over. Uh, make sure that we realize that Yahweh has a schedule that he will keep. And to make sure that we're awake, moving, preparing for everything that the end of the age is going to bring. Uh, Yom Teruah's alarm goes off every year on the first day of the seventh month to remind us that the day of the great shout announces the end of the age, that it has come. Yom Kippur's alarm goes off every year on the tenth day of the seventh month to remind us that the great day of judgment when all things will be made right and set right, that day has come. And Sukkot alarm goes off every year on the 15th day of the seventh month to remind us that the great celebration of tabernacling with Yahweh, after all the wicked and the ungodly have been removed from the earth, that day has come. But there are four, we're going to talk this morning about Yom Kippur. There are four simple things Yahweh instructs us to do. Um, I am and will be tempted to delve into other details. Concerning Yom Kippur, there are a lot of interesting, amazing details that we need to know. <clears throat> and perhaps we'll go over a lot of those Tuesday night. But this morning I'm committed to deal in a concise way with the four things that Yahweh tells us to do. They're the same things we go over every year. They don't change. But we need to go over them and make sure that we understand what Yahweh is instructing us to do. Leviticus 23 verse 26. And Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, Also on the tenth day of the seventh month there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto Yahweh. So here's the first instruction. We're to keep it on the tenth day of the seventh month. Not a day we choose, not a day that's convenient, but on the tenth day of the seventh month. And now do you think when Yahweh spoke that to Moses, do you think he knew what Satan and wicked men through the ages would do to, to the calendar? Sure. How that they would seek to destroy it and replace it with their own calendars that are designed to hide from us Yahweh's appointed days. Do you think that he knew that was going to happen? Of course he did. But the instruction is the same nonetheless. Keep it on the 10th day of the 7th month. And that does not mean July the 10th. Right? That means on his calendar, and, and it takes time and it takes effort to discover details about his calendar. Uh, he set one in place from the beginning. How do we know that? You ever read the story of Noah? When, when you read in Genesis 7, it says, In the second month, the 17th day of the month, the fountains of the great deep were opened up. In Genesis 8, it says, in the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, that the ark rested on the mountains of Ararat. In Genesis 8, 14, it says, in the second month, on the seven and twenty-seventh day of the month, was the earth dried. So there was a calendar. 
And, and Yahweh's people knew how to follow that calendar. On that ark, Noah knew what day it was every day. What day of the week and what day of the month it was. So Yahweh established his, his calendar from the beginning. And when you read about the great deliverance of the children of Israel out of Egypt, if you pay attention, you'll see that before Yahweh ever brought them out of Egypt and carried them to Mount Sinai, he reestablished his uh, calendar with them. They, they have been in Egypt following a different calendar, but he reestablishes his calendar with them. He's not going to take them out until it is reestablished. He told them how to identify the first month, and then he told them certain things he wanted them to do on the first month. So Yahweh's instruction to us here requires that we gain working knowledge of his calendar. We have to know how to identify the first month so that we can know when all the other months appear. And the first month does not start in the dead of winter, does it? Makes no sense. It starts according to the book of Exodus on a new moon when the barley is in the abib stage. How many of you grow barley? <laughs> Me either. Uh, but that's okay. In Alabama, you can tell when the first month is arrived by a new moon appearing when the daffodils and the yellow bells are starting to bloom and when trees are beginning to bud. When you see those things, those things are alerting you to be looking for the new moon that is going to start the new year. And from there you count the months from one new moon to the other. The sun marks the days, the moon marks the months, and the stars mark the years. Those things, were, according to Genesis 1, were put in place by Yahweh to mark time for us. What other instructions does Yahweh give to us in verse 27? First instruction is follow the calendar. The second uh, instruction, let, let, let me say this, that tempted here just a little bit. Uh, this is worthy of mentioning. It, shall, it says there shall be a day of atonement. It doesn't tell us to make atonement. It says that there will be a day of atonement. Atonement is made not by us, not by anything we do, but it's made for us by our high priest. It's something that Yahweh and Yeshua do for us. Instruction number two, though, in, in this passage is you shall have a holy convocation. So that's what we're going to do Tuesday night. Look at uh, verse 1 and 2 of Leviticus 23. And Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, Concerning the feast of Yahweh, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feast. We cannot give the feast of Yahweh their proper honor without proclaiming them to be kept as part of a holy convocation. This is the... Um, the word convocation there is the Hebrew word mikra. And mikra is a called out public assembly. Another definition of the word mikra is rehearsal. That's the reason we refer to these oftentimes as rehearsals. So Yahweh expects all of his feasts to be celebrated with an assembly that is viewed as a rehearsal for us. Now, are there people who cannot assemble? Absolutely. Absolutely. There are people who would love to assemble and who long to assemble, but who cannot assemble either for age, health reasons, or they absolutely have no one to assemble with in their area. There are people who cannot, but that, that must not prevent us from, what, from declaring what Yahweh said to declare. He said, declare my feast to be holy convocations. Because the issue isn't always that somebody cannot. Sometimes it's the issue that they will not. So our duty is simple. Declare them to be a convocation. So we should assemble together. Let me show you a couple examples of this. Go to Acts chapter 2. You know what it says before we go there, but look at it anyway. I think this is a perfect example of the importance of having a holy convocation. Acts 2.1 when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were having a holy convocation. You understand? 
They were just doing what Leviticus 23 told them to do. They had gathered together as part of their observance of Shavuot. <clears throat> Another illustration that might not be as uh, clear, but is definitely there, is in Mark chapter 11. Mark 11 verse 7 says this, And they brought the coat to Yeshua, and they cast their garments on him, and he sat upon him. And many spread their garments. Notice that. Many spread their garments in the way, and others cut down branches off the trees and strawed them in the way. John 12 says this, On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Yeshua was coming to, Jer coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that comes in the name of Yahweh. So on the next day, much people were come to the feast. Verse 8 of Mark 11 says, many spread their garments. Now Mark 11 verse 9. And they that went before and they that followed cried, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of Yahweh. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of Yahweh. Hosanna in the highest. So how many people were there? Much and many, it says. The Pharisees tell you how many there were. In John 12, 19, the, the Pharisees therefore said among themselves when they saw it, Perceive ye how we prevail nothing. Behold, the world is gone with him. Or gone after him. So the crowd was so huge. That was shouting Hosanna. That the Pharisees said. The world is, is taken off after him. So it's a pretty good crowd. Well what were all these people doing there? How did they just happen to be there that day? They're rehearsing. You go back and look at it. It's clear as day that. This event happened on the 10th day of the first month. They knew from Exodus 12 that on the 10th day of the first month, the lambs to be brought into the house. They've been rehearsing that for years. In that moment, in that moment, they realized that what they had been rehearsing for thousands of years was now becoming a reality. The Pharisees will later convince them that they were wrong, but in that moment they were convinced that what they had been rehearsing was a reality. They were convinced that the Lamb of Yahweh was entering into Yahweh's house. So assembling and rehearsing are vital parts of our keeping the feast of Yahweh. Just as they were vital parts of the, the first four they're vital in the last three that we are assembling on the day that Yahweh tells us to assemble. So, Yahweh instructs us to know and mark our calendars for the 10th day of the 7th month. We have done that. He tells us to have a holy convocation. What's the third instruction? In Leviticus 23, 27, what's the third thing he tells us to do? Okay, thank you. I was going to wait y'all out. <laughs> you shall afflict your souls. <coughs> well, how do we do that? Traditionally, Yom Kippur is observed with a fast as part of afflicting our soul. We do not consume food on that day. But there is more to the word afflict, uh, more involved in afflicting our soul than in just fasting. The word means to be brought into subjection, to be humbled. So the instruction is for us to humble ourselves and to bring ourselves into subjection. There are three primary illustrations of this in the scripture of this word afflict, and I use them quite often. Uh, we're told in Exodus that Pharaoh afflicted the Israelites. That is, he brought them into subjection and made slaves out of them. He humbled them and made slaves out of them. This word is also used when Delilah asked Samson, how can someone afflict you? That's a great question to be asked by your significant other, isn't it? How can someone afflict you? 
That is, she was saying, how can someone gain power over you, humble you, and bring you into subjection? Hagar became pregnant and forgot who she was. We're told that Sarah afflicted her. What does that mean? It means that she humbled her and reminded her who she was and brought her back into subjection to her as a servant. Now, Hagar didn't take too kindly to that. She didn't like it. So she ran away. And when she ran away, uh, the angel of Yahweh found her. And how he addressed her is noteworthy. The angel said to her, Sarah's maid? Where did you come from and where are you going? What are you doing here? The angel addressed her as Sarah's maid. Had to be reminded that she was still a servant. So when Yahweh tells us to afflict our soul, it's more than telling us to fast. He is telling us to assemble and to have a rehearsal where we humble ourselves and subdue ourselves under the mighty hand of Yahweh. Peter said it this way in 1 Peter 5, 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yes, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For Yahweh resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. That's quite a statement there. Yahweh resists the proud. And he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of Yahweh, that he may exalt you in due time. I think it's, it's far too easy to begin to feel that our pregnancy has elevated us above where we should see ourselves. We, we became pregnant with the truth of the Sabbath. And then with the feast. And then with all of Torah. And it's easy to start having elevated opinions of our spiritual position. Yom Kippur is, is Yahweh's alarm set to remind us that the day of, of atonement is coming. Every wrong is going to be made right. But we're going to be saved on the day of that great outpouring of his wrath. But not saved from it because of anything we have done. Saved from it because of Yeshua. Yom Kippur is an alarm set to remind us that our position has not changed because of anything we became pregnant with. Our position is the same. We are Yahweh's servants. Go to Luke 17 and look at this with me. This is a teaching of Yeshua that few get excited about. But listen to him in Luke 17 verse 7. Which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by when he has come from the field, go and sit down to meet? And will not rather say unto him, make ready wherewith I may sup or wherewith I may eat, gird yourself, serve me till I have eaten and, and drank, and afterwards you shall eat and drink. Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. He doesn't bring the servant in and lavish praise on him because he plowed the field and fed the cattle or fetched him dinner. Why? Because that's what he's there for. That's what he's been told to do. I think we'd rather read that and say when the servant came in all kind of praise was lavished upon him for what he had done. But Yeshua said no. Verse 10, likewise ye when you shall have done all those things which are commanded you say we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. 
We have not done some great thing when we keep the Sabbath or the feast or Torah. It seemed like it at the time because we'd been deceived for so long, but we, we have not done great things when we keep the Sabbath or the feast. We have done what is our duty to do. Correct. It just took us a long time to find it out. Right. It's our duty to do these things. So in Yom Kippur, we bring our souls back into submission as servants of Yahweh, where we're able to, to readjust our thinking to say, Yahweh, I should have been doing this all along. Somebody should have showed me a long time ago. And now that I'm doing it, I know it's just my duty. It's not some great thing. It is my duty to do these things. The boxer Mike Tyson is credited with saying this about discipline. He said, discipline is doing what you hate to do, but nonetheless doing it like you love it. I would tweak that for us today and say it this way. Afflicting our soul is reminding ourselves that we are to love being servants of Yahweh walking in obedience to Him. We are to afflict our soul until we learn to love being his servant and just doing what is our duty to do. So, four things. Mark the calendar. Have a holy convocation. Afflict your soul. What's the fourth instruction? The last sentence, what did you say? The last sentence in verse 27 isn't for us. If you look at that last sentence there, that instruction is for the high priest. It's his job to, to take the offering. To make the sacrifice, I should say. Our fourth instruction is elaborated on in uh, the next few verses. So it must be very important instruction because it gets stated and then restated. Let's read this instruction beginning in verse 28. And you shall do no work in that same day. For it is a day of atonement to make atonement for you before Yahweh your Elohim. For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. Whatsoever soul it be that does any work in that same day, that same soul will I destroy from among his people. You shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generation and all your dwellings. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest. You shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month at even, even from even unto even, shall you celebrate your Sabbath. So three times we're told to afflict our soul and five times we're told to rest or do no work. Five times he said it. Rest, do no work. This day is to be set aside for humbling ourselves into the mindset of a servant. We're not to work, we're to rest from our labors. Look at verse 32. It says, you shall celebrate your Sabbath. Celebrate is not a real great translation of the Hebrew word used there. It actually says in the Hebrew, you shall Shabbat your Shabbat. You shall Shabbat your Shabbat. It, it means you shall rest on purpose on the day of rest. It means to be diligent and to set your face that you're going to cease from any and all labor. Shabbat your Shabbat. We don't just simply have a Shabbat where no work is done. We have a Shabbat where we on purpose, with a purpose, cease from all of our labors. A proclamation, if you will, a rehearsal, if you prefer, that on the Day of Atonement, all we can do, all we will do is rest in what was done and is being done to deliver us. Let me say that again. We rest on purpose as a proclamation. We're determined to rest as a proclamation showing how determined we are to understand 
that what's done for us on the day of atonement has nothing to do with us, but everything to do with him. That there is nothing we can do to make atonement. We just have to rest that Yahweh and Yeshua are doing it for us. Here's the conclusion. We have marked on our calendar Tuesday night at sunset, the 10th day of the 7th month, to observe Yom Kippur. We have set a holy convocation and will have one. Each of us must for ourselves, I can't do it for you and you can't do it for me. Each of us for ourselves must bring our souls into subjection and with joy reassert ourselves as servants of Yahweh. We will begin a fast that night as an outward sign of the inward work that must take place. Then we will Shabbat our Shabbat. Sunset Tuesday to sunset Wednesday. On purpose and with a purpose. We will enter into rest. Four simple things. Keeping Yahweh's feast are not hard or difficult. We'll talk more about the significance of it Tuesday night. But for today, I just wanted to talk about the simplicity. Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. As his name is put upon you, so shall he himself bless you.